Well, I'd like to thank Jan for having organized this event. Fantastic convergence. Different vantages. We need this congregation of opposites on this particular topic. I'm coming from the art world, really. Multi-generational art family, quite famous in Europe in sculpture and painting. Um, the semantic art is one aspect of our work. Semantic art, what's that? It takes multiple fields of information. Egyptology, to modern physics, to the Rig Veda, to sacred geometry, to multi-dimensional theories, to mathematical number systems, to art. I'm also a musicologist and the founder of the 432 Hertz modern popular movement of music um, based on the old French pitch, which is also based on harmonic numbers that you find in the various mythologies and architectures of the world. As an eschatological thinker, we were propelled into the ultimate or utmost sphere by two near-death experiences when we were 11 and 15. The second near-death experience also activated the UFO. My story is extensive. I've been 33 years in the public um, working with the UFO field and many other different fields. So there is absolutely no time to go into my story per se. The only thing that was um, a little bit of an irritant in the oyster shell over time was sure, I could bring people to see the UFO when it was in a wave, because this happens in waves. Um, as a teenager, it was very regular, almost daily. Um, then, in my 20s, I was left to my own devices with strong backup. Um, today, I hardly see the phenomenon, except when we engage dialogues with the cosmos. Dialogues with the Cosmos is what we will be looking at today a bit. It's a European effort where uh, civilian units are engaged to bring in a UFO through coherent protocols. Coherent protocols that are measurable by biofeedback, and the biofeedback methodologies are utilized. Those coherent Biofeedback technologies practiced as the objective is then utilized in the high mountain sites to some of the, US, uh, the UFO. Um, we call this a form of new art emerging in humanity. We are non-dogmatic. We're going to speak in certainties. It's our style. Um, when we say it is, you can just say, well, yeah, maybe. Um, we have a lot of experience directly with the UFO. For us, there is no doubt of the reality of an intelligence behind and through the UFO. Our understanding of what it is today is very different to when I started going through the experience um, during my teens on a regular basis. Today I've had a lot of time to go through the human meditation process of what is going on. And it makes you review everything, every aspect of reality. Now, it's interesting with skepticism, I believe in skepticism, healthy skepticism. Um, you've got the societies for the claims of the paranormal, made by Jam James Randi in England, who will give you a million pounds if you find one paranormal person or one paranormal event. No one's claimed the cash. Then there is the society for the claims of the normal in the USA. If you can find one normal person and one normal or average sunset, you get a million dollars. No one's claimed the cash. So what is reality? And this is where the UFO pushes the envelope. It's one of the main steerers in our day and age. So um, our experience and bringing units to field work to engage protocols, to measure, um, to take various forms of measurements, we call a new form of art. And for many of the dialoguers, it will continue for a while until they push to the edge of fear. That often happens. We call this the dawning of the age of the art of cosmic dialogue 
by the artist of consciousness. I'm a, a member of the board of directors um, of the New York New Observations Art and Culture magazine. And we're bringing out the artists, the famous artists. Um, New Observations was created by Lucio Pozzi 33 years ago um, to propagate um, art, culture, ecology, but also the deeper worlds. Now a lot of artists are coming out of the woodwork. Art is a interface for this subject. So in this concept, the environment is the canvas. The artist is consciousness. The protocols that are utilized with clear, coherent intent, coherent cardio rhythms are the brush strokes. This interfaces with other consciousness that emerges in the canvas, which is the environment, and which is measurable as well. So we train the units who all want to see the UFO intelligences and don't want to pay attention to the details, look at the directions. There's going to be two time trackers who are going to say what time it is. And if it's too spectacular, the event, um, then we estimate as soon as we've got a bit of time, we say between this time and that time, let's say 10 minutes. So you've got a rough estimation. One of the most important tools is the satellite trackers. Whilst it's true that when you have something moving in the sky, this can instigate for some people other phenomenon, um, we being more down to earth. So we are specifically uh, pre-checking satellites and using different satellite measuring um, systems and applications. That's vitally important. When you have a moving light in the sky, however, maybe at a high magnitude uh, satellite level, one utilizes the protocol, focuses, and see if it responds. And we have had quite clear responses. So we are from a multi-generational art family. Um, my grandfather in the Swiss Alps became a sculptor um, when a golden light came over him. Something that would happen to me um, 46, when I was 46 years ago, when I was two and a half years. <coughs> my mother, uh, this, here I am in his atelier. So he became a sculptor when a golden light in the Swiss Alps engulfed him, and he woke up having made a human head out of the snow near the area of Sion. Um, my mother, renowned in Europe for her artwork, was to experience the UFO with me. Um, it's a long story, but I showed her the UFO, and she saw the landings, she saw um, the communications, etc. She painted UFOs as a result. When I was 17, I was having um, almost daily experiences, but there are many different levels of experience that occur. Um, there would be physical lights in the sky that would move and then park above me um, and train my body. And I would have a tingling through all my cells, which is quite typical. A lot of people know this and have experienced this. And then I would be told to go inside and I would experience something I used to call ETI VR, extratemporal intelligence virtual reality where you have a somatic experience with the five senses, where you're traveling um, out of the body, but this is not an out-of-body experience. I did plenty of that as well um, for another period. Um, this ETVR experience, you're guided um, to places like the moon, uh, the moons of Jupiter, and other places. Um, we also receive tons of information. And then seven years in, we took that information and we also kind of rebelled, say, wait a minute, we want to question everything, absolutely everything. Uh, what is going on here? Because some of the information was too much. And so I went into my researcher phase, which is what gave birth to the semantic artist. The semantic artist has a canvas, which would be the multimedia, has sentences as brush strokes with various concepts that build a montage, that build the final painting. That's how we work through many, many, many different fields and subjects. With dialogues with the cosmos, we have one semantic art palais to play with. <coughs> 
So first contact that I remember vividly because of chocolate um, is high up in the Swiss Alps. It's about 3,000 meters at the Ferpecle Glacier. A couple of years ago, we took a dialogues team there and had some good results. We're going to look at the film of that. My mother was painting the trees in this area, and I was sitting by a pond, pondering on the pond. And as I was pondering on the pond, a golden sphere came next to me. Then the sphere engulfed me. It's very difficult to remember, but what I remember was cascades of infinite vacuum which has happened numerous times with regards to the UFO. I emerge and I'm drawing lemniscates in the sand and announce myself to the search party head, Michelle, who's been looking for hours for me. So my mother had to go down the village because her two years and uh, six month old child had vanished in the wilderness of Switzerland in the high Alps. Search party assembled, and they were looking for me for hours. That was not my experience of the vacuum emptiness. Um, I remember it particularly well because uh, Jean-Michel got um, Jean-Luc, excuse me, Jean-Luc got a full Swiss chocolate bar, and I'd never had a Swiss chocolate bar. And we know the year because uh, the paintings she made are signed '72. So, the work has been taking place in the high Alps of Switzerland, Austria, Italy, uh, Mount Etna, and Norway in earlier times. Many different types of witnesses um, are present. You have lieutenants, you have physicists, you have aeronautical engineers, but you also have artists, you have New Agers, you have all kinds of different broad-spectrum people. We try to do this non-dogmatically. Not interested in the UFO sect or cult aspect. It's a big problem in the UFO field. Um, but we try to engage the ultimate uh, intent of coherence in interfacing with the unidentified aerial phenomena intelligence <coughs> and to gather data, signal intelligence. And we gather wide varieties of signal intelligence. So, a way to look at this for us is. A new creative faculty is awakening in mankind, some human beings. This may take thousands of years, but it will become a regular reflex for some to go out in the mountains or out in nature, look at the stars, and engage the creativity of the UFO encounter. Certainly, the most creative brain states and heart states, according to the research and studies of the HeartMath Institute, is a cycle of about eight cycles per second, which is also the frequency detected by the Hestalen Research Association in Norway, analyzing the UFOs that manifest there with five different countries having their scientists research it over time. Professor Erling Strand told me that a cycle of about eight cycles per second appears before the UFO is recorded and is measured. This is the maximum creativity in the artist, in the poet, in the one doing Tai Chi. So, environment is the canvas, the artists are consciousness, and Earthside plus the other UFO are part of the interactive art. A creative new faculty. We're allowed to do that. Art is eccentric at times. Um, the ultra-terrestrial um, hypothesis is not our hypothesis. We think it has elegant aspects, but much more is going on. I can't get into that now, but perhaps with Jan we will go into what we think is going on. With the um, idea of ultra-terrestrial, you have many different forms of possibilities. This includes the interdimensional hypothesis of Jacques Vallée, um, it also includes other realities, dimensions, parallel universes that coexist. Um, and it also may include the time traveling elements. So, our great, 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 great grandchildren time traveling back. 
ultra terrestrial is not enough. The reality rethinking that occurs through the UFO experience and many other fields, uh, we had uh, the fake news of UFO, we have the fake news of politics, we've done um, a series called Macro Revelations for a Fake Reality, where we examine every field and every assumption, certain histories, certain books, things that we take as God-given and look to ask the question, is this real? Where's the fakeness? And we show the fakeness. You have it in astronomy. You have it in physics. True objectivity has never been gained in the old physics, like quantum mechanics, as we mentioned earlier today. So the idea of the ultra-terrestrial widens the extraterrestrial hypothesis a bit. The simulation theories that are now emerging, reality is a computer simulation, and we're starting to simulate molecules, we'll move to cells um, in our computational work, and eventually, 500 years, 1,000 years, we can start to simulate whole human beings, whole environments, whole planets. And in a whole planet with human beings, 20% can be simulators that can be simulating their simulated world. And if, so if you take that forwards, 500,000, 5,000 years, at some point, reality and the simulation are going to be indivisible. Um, and based on those ideas and projections from past computational exponential increase um, by Moore's law and more, um, to the future, it's likely that our great, 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 great grandchildren are going to be simulating reality, and maybe this is even interfacing with that simulation, where the mouse cursor on the screen could be, for instance, the UFO. Um, I mentioned earlier this morning, and I think it remains r important, um, the uh, press conference that was made on September 28th of 2010, um, where you had 120 signed affidavits of high-level military officers who were working with the launch uh, facilities and the ICBMs, International uh, Intercon uh, Intercontinental uh, Missile Systems, uh, ballistic missiles. Um, where UFOs would engage the base and turn off nuclear missiles. In some cases, turn them on and then turn them off in different countries. The UFO and the atomic have been indivisibly co-present. Uh, Robert Hastings now has 150 witnesses with these credentials. So these are very clear, credible witnesses and witness testimonies. Um, the UFO appears not only in the night, but during the day. NASA has also admitted that uh, the space shuttle Atlantis, for example, uh, couldn't land um, because these spheres were in the sky, and so there was a delay. We don't know what they are. They just happen to come here and there. We don't know where they come from. But that was an admission in 2006. For 300 years, astronomers have been obser observing and reporting UFOs leaving Mars and Venus crossing the sun. There are many cases. In, in 1992, I wrote a fat book, 684 pages, called The Alien Presence. Uh, which catalogued a lot of those and many other military testimonies. I gave a press conference in Copenhagen in, on January uh, 1991 to 75 journalists called the Alien Pres JFK and the Alien Presence. Um, so at that point, we were still in that paradigm. Nevertheless, there is plenty of records that for 300 years, astronomers have seen these objects leaving Mars, Venus, the Moon, Crossing the Sun, this is from 1896, French astronomer seeing an object by the sun, kind of heralding the age of dialogue. I think the age of dialogue is a natural, artistic, embedded uh, process, which was pioneered um, in modern times by Canada, 
Wilbert B. Smith from the, the Department of Transport was engaged into the Project Magnet, which was Canada's own UFO research official system. He was particularly interested in communicating with the intelligences. The famous Smith Memorandum from 1950, which states, of course, after a meeting in Washington with top U.S. Uh, military personnel who were in on the mystery of the flying saucers, as they were called then, by Kenneth Arnold, says that flying saucers exist, they are classified higher than the H-bomb, which is the highest classification that existed at that time, and their modus operandi is unknown, and they are being studied by a small group headed by Vannevar Bush. Also, certain mental phenomena was being explored in how they operated. In fact, Wilbur B. Smith went deep into mental phenomena. There was radio contact with a being who called itself AFA, which, if you look in history, uh, you find it is a word in Enochian, from Dr. John D., who created the Royal Society and who was Queen Elizabeth's cryptographer, um, and was dabbling with all kinds of different worlds. There was ham radio contact. There was tensor beam contact, an entraining beam uh, that would convey the same information. Wilbert B. Smith himself, who was a master of technology, of communication technology. During World War II, he made big antenna systems. Um, so he was one of the chief communication experts at that time. Um, so a great man for Canada. Um, was interested in communication technology, was his field. Um, so he used, in the end, dreams to make his technologies. Dreams from AFA and he would actually fine-tune his devices. He also contacted um, many contactees. Um, he gave a questionnaire out through the US and Canada and all over the world, and when the items were correctly uh, filled in, he knew he had the genuine deal. Amidst those was George Van Tassel and even George Adamski, whatever you may think of him. Um, but more importantly, there was his main contact was Dr. Arthur Matthews, who was the protege of Nikola Tesla, who confirmed the information on a phys so-called physical level. Matthews' description of the ship is like a living entity. It had horticultural domains. Um, the walls were living cybernetic systems. He could look at them, and he was immediately entrained into the cybernetic environment like a virtual reality. And this was descriptions from the 1940s. And this was published in the Ottawa Science Journals. I got a copy in my early research of some of those. <clears throat> there was, of course, um, Francis Swan was one of his communicators with AFA. So, the U.S. Navy document of Knowles talks about the AFA affair. Um, the age of dialogue is to engage cosmic intelligence in communication and get something perhaps valuable. Technology was being explored by Wilbert B. Smith in terms of the information exchange. There is a CERN physicist, Beatrice, Dr. Beatrice Gata Vera, who has introduced a new concept to deal with the Fermi paradox, which is the subanthropic principle. The subanthropic principle engages the idea of the strong anthropic principle, which is an observer oriented universe. There's no universe unless there is an observer to observe it. Um, there is the weak anthropic principle too, but it doesn't hold this logistics. We really need to keep logistics alive. Logic is vital in these fields. Um, and that also means admitting error, discovering error, and correcting it. Um, and also taking macro views of certain areas without saying this is dogmatic truth, not getting caught in the macro either. So the uh, strong 
anthropic principle taken into the sub-anthropic principle goes this way. Astronomers are seeing the beginning of the universe, more or less, like 11 billion, 12 billion years ago, if you believe in the Big Bang theory and an expanding universe. There is good evidence that can argue against that as well, like the Society for the Claims of the Normal and the Society of the Claims of the Paranormal. Um, there are great contrasts, and these are important to always keep in mind. Certainly for me, the experiences with the UFO intelligences, ultra-terrestrial, hyper-terrestrials, extra-temporal intelligences, whatever they are, they are living consciousness beings, they are real, but they make one question everything completely. The experiences, the human digestion of the experiences. The human part is extremely important, the human meditation of cosmic disclosure. So in the subanthropic principle, there must have been observers 11 billion years ago, 12 billion years ago. How did they get there? Lots of theories could be put out there. They're time travelers. They're using multiple dimensions. This is a simulation, etc. But they were there to observe the universe because we see it. So they've had a lot of time to do genetic engineering, every form of genetic engineering, stem cell engineering, computer sciences. Look at the 100 years where we've got with computer sciences. We're simulating molecules. And soon we'll be able to simulate a body or a primitive organism at the least. We're getting closer and closer to that point of view. So billions of years to develop this. So Francis Crick, discoverer of DNA, double helix, said in a book in 1975 that if you look at chance random selection, there's not enough time for the complexity and diversity of life here. The only explanation for him was not Pam Spermia, that an asteroid brings life here, not enough time. It can only be an intelligently, intelligently controlled probe that is releasing the best of the best of genetic specimens. So a designer world, in his point of view, not necessarily mine at all, um, but it's a stepping stone. In the subanthropic principle, therefore, the best en engineering has already been done, reality synthesis has already been done, Time and space travel has been done. You've had billions of years to do it. And you make designer worlds, like our planet. The position of the sun and the moon, in particular, stand out. You take the equatorial circumference of the moon 108 times, and you have the distance to Earth in the mean of its elliptical orbit. If you take the heart of the sun, the equatorial circumference of the sun 108 times, in the mean of the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the Sun, you have the distance to Earth. These are no coincidences. The Moon rotates over 27 days. Recent NASA analysis of the heliosphere finds that the equatorial circumference is also rotating over 27 days. So you have this synchronization. 27, 54, 54 times 208. So you get this numerical, geometrical, because 54 and 108 are pentagon angles, so they have golden mean significance. And the golden mean is a transient harmonic foundation of our universe. It never ends. So we have this impossible situation where without the moon, there would not be seasons, there wouldn't be tides, the flow of water, the correct magnetic field to support the bacterias, that enable advanced life. Without the sun, also no life, because we have no light. They both can be taken 108 times from the equatorial circumference to Earth. That sounds artificial. In the subanthropic principle, the super civilizations that would be space and time travel, Ling, and would also be dimensional traveling. There are different concepts of dimensions and hyper-civilizations of this CERN physicist's idea, the hyper-civilizations have engineered them into higher brain, B-R-A-N-E, worlds, um, where they can exist as pure light, pure information. Um, they can reach speed of light, singularity, etc. These super and hyper-civilizations put themselves into stealth mode. They make themselves invisible but they bury in the laws of physics 
They bury in all different fields of information in our world clues. That's the subanthropic principle. We are naked in that super civilization according to the subanthropic principle. It's a very appealing idea. For those of you who may not have had a significant UFO experience. Now, Trump, President Trump, in his inauguration speech, spoke about our country will thrive and prosper again. We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the Earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. I spoke about the uh, creation of new technologies and space explorations. His uncle, Dr. John Trump, was raising him as a teenager and as a child even, and warning him significantly on the dangers of nuclear and chemical weapons. He was also working under Vannevar Bush, the guy who was studying UFOs, according to the Project Magnet Memorandum of Smith, the Canadian head of the UFO research, governmental UFO research of Canada, who worked with Dr. Arthur Matthews. Dr. Arthur Matthews has 80 patents behind him. This is an old picture of him. He's now gone quite a while. And Dr. John Trump was fascinated by the work of Dr. Nikola Tesla. In fact, he was assigned to receive all of the arcane writings of Dr. Tesla. And he was fascinated by the vacuum tube technology because he'd been involved in old electronics. Dr. Matthews was specifically recreating the vacuum tube technology that Tesla made and utilized in 1903 to, he said, in public, receive messages from Mars and Venus. He introduced Dr. Matthews in 1942 to the UFO intelligences. With this device, Matthews was able to pick up communication. It was fairly large. Teslascope. And have a contact. The intelligences that emerged were clearly fresh. Like many experiences with the so-called Nordic class, it looks like they are fresh, that they are spatialized out of fresh stem cells. So often even the lips are still blue, have not been fully flooded through with blood and no fingerprints, no lines on the hands. Um, the super or hyper-civilization will have perfected billions of years ago already stem cell technology and then stem cell cybernetics, which would enable rapid biochemical spatialization of a body form for any particular local environment. Um, so they had perfect symmetry um, on both sides. Um, the ship had a central pillar, and in the 50s, I think it was 1957, um, after the first Sputnik was put up, Wilbert B. Smith got to see, by arrangement, through Dr. Matthews, this ship with a blue series of spinning uh, laser-like lights around it. Matthews said that there were four pilots in the middle that were tuning their bodies to the cosmic intelligence, the anthropic principle, or the anthropos of the various fields of studies. Anthropos doesn't root back to the Gnostics or the Egyptians. It roots back not just to the Persians, but to the most archaic Sarasvati River Valley uh, culture, which has 14,000-year-old cities like in Mirgara. I visit one 
um, in 2004 in Kalibangan, which was 8,000 years old, fully developed with bricks, sewage systems, water systems, and all 88 constellations. And the uh, Sanskrit alphabet transcribed to the pictograms, the 50 letters to the pictograms that they use. This is the root of the idea of a godhead or anthropos, um, the root of the idea of the cosmic Christ or mega point of Teilhard de Chardin um, and other eschatologists' exploration therein. So the root describes a cosmic intelligence. It describes also, furthermore, that the Rig Veda, the oldest manuscript of mankind, has none human authorship. So the Anukramanas, the appendixes of the Rig Veda, describes the various non-human families and authors that write it. So this is the genesis of history. You have the 88 constellations. You've got descriptions of the atoms. You've got a description of the speed of light, 4,000 440 Yoyana and Halfa Nimesa is the description in Mandala 2 of the Rig Veda. Um, you've got a description of two world halves, so the earth is round. You've got Buja, who is taken by a flying vehicle, uh, who is on the edge of death and is resurrected and is taken up into space by the Asvina twins, which are numinous beings in the Rig Veda, um, and describes the two world halves and going around the world. And then he describes 3,600 years being warped at the same time, and then 10,800 years, and then myriads of these becoming the Abavam or the ocean of the boundless depth as a vacuum infinity. And then the reversing of that, and the ship takes him into the mountains and out through the mountains, and he's born again. So you have plenty of those stories. You have Varuna who takes. Uh, the initiate through his ship to the city of ships, which is enormous. Now, with Dr. Arthur Matthews, um, who called this ship the X-12, he describes that the beings say they come 3,969 years from the future. So this would be a future Venus that has been terraformed with Picotech or Femtotech. I know scientists today in hadronic mechanics that are working with Femtotech. Picotech, in that sense, is outdated. Nanotech is certainly way gone. It's interesting and useful in many applications. So this leads more to the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis. So this is Dr. John Trump with the Tesla technology. Here he is with a young Trump. He, he was w meeting with Nikola Tesla here. He absorbs all of the patents, including the advanced vacuum systems. At the end of his life, Dr. John Trump was working on a Tesla-based time machine, 1984, 1985, as well as a, a device that would heal all different kinds of illnesses. Now, in the testimony of William F. Hamilton, in 1952, mass dialogues began as tens of thousands of pe 10,000 people or so would uh, go to the giant rock base um, of George Van Tassel. Um, and during the summer congresses, would summon UFOs, which came. There were no satellites in those days. So Sputnik was 1957. 1952, 1954, 1955, 1956, 10,000 people getting used to these objects of moving light. You aim at them with a torch. They shift direction. You aim them with the car lights, which they got used to taking out of the car and actually assembling systems to f uh, flash at them. And they would jump, zigzag, etc. This is what we've been experiencing with dialogues with the cosmos. And we call this an alphabet. I'm just going to skip over that slide and go back to it. So we believe there is an interactive cybernetic um, alphabet where consciousness appears to affect the UAP, the Unidentified Flying Phenomenon. You're aiming with the laser 
of coherence, that is co a compassionate heart when you measure it in biofeedback, and willed intent, consciousness harnessing biological coherence and focusing it like a laser at the object. Does it respond? One response is it goes zigzag. Another is it brightens up and powers down. Name, power up from James Gilliland. Pulse flashes with your heart or with a laser in earlier times. It will respond to the number of flashes. And this is quite impressive in that sense when you do it with the heart and not with a physical laser. Intent with the heart and you get three responses exactly after you're aiming it and focusing it. Um, it may arc in an arch trajectory as an alphabet letter, or it jumps in response to the coherent willed intent laser, or jumps and flashes. Um, there was several experiences where it seemed the experience was that it was time traveling, that you're watching time travel in the jump. You're seeing everything in between occurring. Um, everybody has that sensation when it occurs. And then combinations of those. There is a whole alphabet of interactivity. But every dialogue with the cosmos has been different. And of course, we get better and better at chartering um, the territory. So everyone learns directions, one learns the constellations, atmospheric conditions, uh, and these kind of things. We also use other forms of input, which includes the Einstein imaging technique. The Einstein imaging technique developed by Einstein. Einstein didn't believe in the small window of radio astronomy. The advanced civilizations, should they be there, would use something more akin to consciousness. Einstein held two steins, or two stones, um, and would join or fuse his senses together. His five senses, and he would imagine he was having contact with this extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial intelligence to formulate some of his visionary moments. Einstein imaging, was, or image streaming, was further developed by Dr. Charles Reinhardt, um, professor of physics, department of chemistry physics, at Southwestern State University, Marshall, Minnesota. He was able to train from 30 mentally handicapped patients, 17. 17 of these patients got the technique together. They were able to visualize, smell, hear, taste, feel, use the five senses to sense somatically the extraterrestrial environment, um, and would ask for scientific um, information. He would measure with electroencephalogram the brain waves, act, the brainwave activity, and found that as the image streaming was taking place, all eight poles of the brain would be linked at eight cycles per second, which is the alpha hemisync frequency of the both hemispheres of the brain coming into synchrony to the pineal gland and the development of melatonin and penaline. Um, and maximum creativity. Here, all eight poles of the brain are linked, not just two hemispheres. They also have to speak, and this happens when they speak, when they channel uh, what they experience. You suspend critical thinking when you do this phase. Afterwards, you do the critical analysis. We do the same in the dialogues with the cosmos fieldwork. I believe this is the future for, for all the different stargazing groups. There's many who are saying, look, look, that great, fantastic UFO, and no one's measuring, are there any satellites there? You need to have those different documentary parameters. Um, and we've used this year some new equipment, uh, which is very exciting, um, and which I have to get to. So the patents that were received by all 17 uh, mentally handicapped patients um, <coughs> passed the U.S. Patents Office as working devices. So the 17 patents received by Einstein Imaging Channeling uh, from ET, the physicists 
of the US patent offices said these are working devices. So it works. Um, and this is the 8 hertz principle. Um, and we utilize this Einstein imaging as one signal line. So there are those who choose for that night field work to specialize in recording such input. Others may have been trained in various different branches of remote viewing. They will take a signal line. Uh, we take background radiation signal line. We take atmospheric uh, information signal line. Uh, we take uh, the uh, Tesla bot. We, we also uh, take sound measurements. There's a lot of data here to go through. So um, we had very successful results. Uh, some of it's on film. Uh, but just before I get to that, I want to show this year's work. So the field work is, of course, during the night between 1 o'clock to 5, 5 o'clock in the summer. And then in the day, we do the debriefings. This is where you get really valuable information. So people are sharing everything they've experienced, what they've seen. Uh, everything is recorded, so we've got a record of it. And we've got everything recorded from the night, both video and audio, um, and other measurements. So then we correlate. Um, and it's very interesting, the kind of information that emerges, the additional details and how they synchronize. Uh, this is information. This is signal raw data. Uh, we don't claim that this is evidence for ET. It just appears that the protocols we utilized, the phenomenon that emerged, um, is consciously interacting. But we're calling it a new form of art. Um, in the last one this summer, in July, um, there was a new phenomenon that emerged, which was patterns of light in the high Swiss Alps um, that uh, would make mandala-like shapes that were seen physically when people were in a specific spot. And this is what came out in the de debriefings. There were also spheres coming down, one of which was filmed. Um, this is Dr. Ros Rosalia Kodogni. Kodogni. Uh, she dis she's a medical emergency doctor. So she describes one of the spheres that came down. There were many members of the group that saw the spheres coming down other side of the group where we did the protocols. Um, and she also got the pulsing uh, mandala systems. Others were seeing zigzaggers, but objects between lines of light, in the, particularly in the area of Vega and Cygnus in, in this dialogues. Others would see red lights with red beams in between um, and in different uh, phases. Now, um, Dr. Kodagni uh, also wrote down immediately all of the patterns that she was observing and put them together. And it appears to be a cipher, which we're working on. So like a bit like Morse code, except that there are more lines to the ovoids as the zeros. That's one form of signal intelligence. What it is, what it concludes, we don't know. We did introduce the concept there of the canvas of the environment and the artist of consciousness. Now, I talked um, in Pescara uh, earlier this year with Professor Kurotkov about our dialogues work and the possibility of using some of his new technology. Um, this is him today in the field, which we could, in fact, do. Kurotkov is very well known for the uh, biowell technology uh, in um, medicine. Konstantin Kurotkov, Professor, uh, of computer science and biophysics at St. Petersburg University of Informational Technology, Mechanics, and Optics in Russia, <coughs> and other faculties. Has published over 400 papers in leading journals on physics and biology, holds 15 patents on biophysics inventions, author of 12 books in many European languages, including electrophotonic analysis in medicine. Well, the ambient sensor called the Sputnik, he's Russian, so, um, uses the biowell, which measures the uh, electrophotonic um, systems of a specific object. Um, Sputnik, um, a biowell Sputnik sensor is an attachment for the biowell device designated for measurements of the el electrical capacity of the space around the Sputnik. 
It can be used for evaluation of the auspicity of the environment and for relative studies of various effects on the environment. BioWell device is an impulse analyzer device that is able to extract electrophotonic emission from the conductive object placed on its electrode, capture the resulting gas discharge created by excitation of air molecules by the electrophotonic emission, and send the created glow images to the computer via USB cable. Um, so he said, well, actually, this has never been used in field work. It's always been uh, done for small case analysis, like graveyards, churches, uh, sacred sites, etc., uh, et sacred architecture. Never in the wild. So in, in the high Swiss Alps, uh, we had a triangulation of Sputniks with biowells to three max. This is the triangulation where the group did the protocol. And what is interesting is the results. Here I'm showing uh, the results in the debriefings. Luckily, uh, could I, Enrico, my translator, but also the Italian representative of uh, Professor Korotkov with Biowell, marked whenever there was a UFO sighting or an anomaly uh, in the sky that was visible to anyone who would look at it. This helps a lot because there's a lot of data. So when we engaged the, the protocol, um, there were marked changes. In one particular uh, area here, the group begins the protocol, coherent protocol that's been trained by biofeedback and is engaged uh, and harnessed with uh, breath work, uh, which increases the uh, intensity of the somatic system. Um, so there's a clear peak that goes up, and then we stop, and then we start focusing um, onto the summation of the UFO. That he found particularly interesting. Professor Korotkov, that is. With the sightings, numerous changes as an object appears. In one occasion, an object creates a fall in the emissions. Something interesting happened at that time, exactly at that time, in the background radiation. I'll show you that in a moment. And here it peaks again, and uh, this one peaks quite significantly, <coughs> as you can see. This is completely new. It's never been done before, let alone in the wilderness, even more so in terms of dialogues with UFOs. Um, so, uh, this is the future. Uh, the Sputnik is going to GPS, environmental measurements, systems, uh, hooked left, right, and center to all information data into one. So, these can happen concurrently. This is briefly reporting on this new research. Here you can see the clear spike as the unidentified aerial phenomena appears over the group. At the 3.30 a.m. point, we have a spike in background radiation. Comparison before uh, we began, the average CPM background radiation went from 5 to 100, maybe 120 at most. During this period, the CPM went up to 347 at 3.33 a.m between two manifestations. So there is some background radiation correlation to that spike, which is interesting. <coughs> they were sold out, but next time, we trust to have a Santilli telescope, which measures matter and antimatter. So this was published, apparent detection via new telescopes with, cons with uh, concave lenses, not convex, um, of otherwise invisible terrestrial entities, as Dr. Rogero Santilli has called them. Um, these telescopes were used in 
hadronic astronomy to detect antimatter galaxies, antimatter asteroids, and other objects, now for years, very popular. The surprise came when it was aimed at the environment. In the environment, the telescope, there is a Galilee telescope that shows the normal environment, and there is the ISO telescope that takes the convex and the concave together. The ISO unit in hadronic mechanics is a brand new field of mathematics. The ISO topic plane is you've got one, and three is just three ones, nine is nine ones. So you've got one to every other one. That's one form of looking at the ISO unit. The ISO unit in geometry is you take a triangle and put it 180 degrees to another triangle, that's the first ISO. But it has an ISO self dual interlocked with it. That's the ISO unit of basic isotopic physics that is lifting all forms of mathematics and unifies all previous forms of mathematics. It's a genius stroke that's extraordinary. Not only that, genotopic plane was introduced by Roger Rosentilli, which proves the holographic universe. Dr. Chris Illett needed to use this to be able to model conch-shell morphologies in the computer because Euclidean mathematics caused the conch-shell morphologies to crumble. And this was published in the Biological Sciences in 1990. It required six arrows of time to model, uh, and that required the genotopic plane, time travel, biological time travel. You've got a cube in the past, backwards and forwards time. You've got a cube in the present, backwards, forwards time. You've got a cube in the future, backwards, forwards time. Those are the six arrows of time required for the conch shell morphology to unfold and yet be uh, in accordance to our Euclidean sensorial apparatus as published in the Biological Sciences domain by Dr. Chris Illett, 1990, who in 1994 with Dr. Rogier uh patented the first hadronic space-time machines based on the same new discoveries, and these have made practical technologies in uh, fuels and in reversing radioactivity, etc. It's a big story. Um, so these ISO telescopes, Centilli telescopes, were detecting different types of objects invisible to the Galileo telescope. Some were pure antimatter, but that does not make sense, because if you take the Tunguska theory in Russia, that was an antimatter reaction causing a big explosion. Bring matter into antimatter, boom. Here you have antimatter spheres moving around intelligently, and many astronomers, hadronic astronomers, are observing these going over technical facilities in the US, uh, which is maybe a bit alarming for some, um, and moving intelligently, but not creating any explosion. Another form of these objects is isomatter, partly matter and antimatter. Now, that's extremely advanced. They're being intelligently maneuvered. They're partly antimatter, and they're partly matter. But they're visible with a Centilli ISO telescope. Um, the technology to get us to engineer a matter that is both matter and antimatter and doesn't create reactions is perhaps 500 years away. Um, so this is a matter light and antimatter light, the concave to the convex lens. At the moment, they're sold out on Amazon. I'm this is how they look like. Different types of objects, dark objects and light objects based on matter or ISO matter. What we want to do in dialogues is we have the Centilli telescopes, we have the Dr. Korotkov devices, and we want to correlate that with quality normal cameras as well. Um, so when an object appears, an unknown appears, um, in accordance to protocol, is it seen before in antimatter? Is it seen in isomatter before it becomes materially decoupled into the visible range. This is an area we want to explore, and I think it's very exciting, based on these published findings. Uh, some of them move very, very fast, indeed. This, those were the Centilli telescopes. Protocol. The 8 hertz cycle is fundamental to the protocol. 
Um, this is Dr. Andrea Puharish, Magnetic Model of Matter and Mind, Physical Foundation of Information Action Transfer in the Healing Process. So, uh, stack of documents not on the internet, which we got in 1990. 8 hertz is the phase velocity difference between the velocities of the orbits of the proton versus the electron. 90% of the universe is hydrogen. In every cubic centimeter of the universe are hydrogen atoms, which have an 8 hertz resonance. So this is a C tone, uh, so it's a fundamental musical tone that we don't hear, but it's in every cubic centimeter of the universe, and it is 92% of the atoms of our body. The DNA also replicates at a cycle of 8 cycles per second, 250 times roughly in a second in a DNA molecule in 32 trillion cells. So the whole universe has a musical foundation of the synchronization of the brain hemispheres, of the most creative states. 8 hertz sets up 16 hertz in the observations of Dr. Puharish. 32 hertz, 64 hertz, 128 hertz, 256 hertz, 512 hertz. And he found that by the electrolysis of water uh, for 72 hours at 8 hertz, water has a dielectric resonance of 8 hertz, uh, that it reaches a peak of 512 hertz. At 512 hertz, a whole musical system emerges of harmonic frequencies of 16 hertz difference each, um, 360 hertz to 720 hertz. So the uh, 432 hertz is the A, for example, is in that sequence. 512 hertz also started to produce life. Amino acids started to form in sterile water. This is all based on 8. So you could say this is, we call this universal tempering, that 8 hertz is the foundation of the architecture of the universe. But also, every dendrite of the brain is utilized or connected when we are in an 8 hertz alpha state. When we're in a beta rhythm state, chit chat, espresso, we're only in some dendrites of the brain in separation. So this is also a form of superconsciousness. That's what Einstein imaging shows. All eight poles of the brain linked at eight hertz. Basically, the brain becomes one with a universal brain. But the heart in compassion, as we will show in a moment, also peaks at eight hertz as it produces the golden proportion in the cardio rhythm. I have to skip over these quickly. So the universal heart-mind, that's what a universal intelligence will utilize. This was the electrolysis of water from the hydrogen atoms, 8 hertz, 8 hertz, 8 hertz, by Puharich, which then uh, produced primitive life uh, in sterile water. This was repeated many times. Over years. Uh, the research of the Heart Math Institute, Dr. Glenn Ryan, and Dr. McCrady, back in the uh, early 90s, they were researching compassion, compassionate cardio, uh, the effect of compassion uh, on cardio rhythms with the EKG or ECG, electrocardiogram. Um, and what they found was that the heart churns out coherent waves, coherent toroidal waves in the golden proportion. Um, however, uh, recently, uh, they did very interesting experiments on DNA samples. Already in the early 90s, they would have a pilot who could sustain coherence in the heart, compassionate love in the heart, philosophically, but sustained biological coherence for two minutes, focus on the DNA sample, which was not their DNA, it was probably animal DNA in the Petri dish. A fluorescence reading was done of that DNA sample to see how the helix was coiled, the focus of compassion and willed intent on the DNA to uncoil it had a result. The DNA uncoiled, or it coiled. But some years ago, one pilot, half a mile distance at times, would focus on the DNA sample, producing three separate results. Uh, a uncoiling, a coiling, and a change in the middle. This is the first time where a new force outside of electromagnetism has been detected, and it only occurs in the coherence of the heart, in biological coherence or cardiorhythms that are felt as compassion, and willed intent utilizes it. 
and it focuses, it peaks at 8 hertz in the early research. Um, it's now a corporate secret, but I don't work for the Heart Math Institute. I've not made any contract with them. So I've got the early papers, which shows how their device works, which is available for anybody. It's called In a Balance. The application is free on the um, iTunes store, and you've got your uh, electrodes, which you pin on your ear, which measures your cardio rhythm. The software interfaces and uh, gives you a breathing sequence, and you get to see a, a beat per minute cycle of your heartbeat, which goes to about 72 BPM, which is the circadian pulse. And you go into coherent states. The coherent states is the green area. Um, and so the more you maintain your coherence, the higher you'll go up into the green. Um, and this is th the only state, the control states, um, of uh, joy or of uh, intellectualism, focusing on a DNA sample, no results. Only biological coherence with willed intent produced a genetic programming, a changing of the DNA. This is suddenly where consciousness interfaces with the DNA. We find it very curious that 8 hertz also occurs before the UFO manifests at Hestalen, according to Dr. Erling Strand. So the UFO, consciousness, and the heart, and genetic engineering are one package. This is a growing up. Other details. Um, so this is one of the early graphs. You see the heart electrocardiogram peak at 8 cycles per second. Even more astonishing for researchers at the time, the forehead electrodes measured an entrainment in the brain of eight cycles per second, the most significant brain state there is. Dr. Carl Bribram from holographic brain modeling couldn't believe it. He had to take the equipment apart because that was impossible, that the heart could entrain the brain in the most significant alpha synchronization state. Um, there is also some change um, at the belly. The most, most important thing is that the harmonic intervals that are produced by the cardiorhythm in compassion is the golden proportion. A golden proportion is a cascade that goes mirror to mirror to mirror to mirror, infinitely, infinitely. Um, it is transient to the universe. It goes on forever. It's life after death, it's life before death. It cascades forever. Um, and it entrains the golden proportion also at the belly and the waves, the toroidal waves, from the brain. So golden lasers. Within the tree, where you have an extremely low frequency coil, also the golden proportion. Not peaking at 8 hertz, but it is the golden proportion. Um, so these are very significant forms of the uh, foundation of the inner balance application and the science thereof. We are built out of the gold mean. The galaxy is built out of the gold mean. But the peak is 8 hertz. So 8 hertz is clearly the biological coherence uh, required um, in engaging the foundation of the universal intelligence. As every cubic centimeter of the universe are hydrogen atoms, which have a resonance of 8 cycles per second, uh, this becomes quite logical. There's a lot of uh, information that has to go with that. Um, Dr. Puharich measured healers' hands, and I go on with this slideshow, measured healers' hands of different varieties, different traditions, Catholic, Huna, etc., um, African, and found, excuse me, too fast, found that um, they were releasing approximately eight cycles per second, and the water would be entrained for months with an eight hertz signature. So it's also healing. He treated over 27 organic uh, diseases with an 8 hertz device that pulsed a single E note of 8 cycles per second, producing the binomial sequence, 16, 32, 64 hertz, etc. Um, and over two years, the studies were done. Uh, several thousand people wore the device. 27 organic diseases were reversed. So it's universal tempering. He also found that the 8 cycles per second passed through a Faraday cage uh, in the 1950s. Uh, first, it was a single Faraday cage, copper, vacuum, copper. Uh, nothing is supposed to go through the Faraday cage if it's electromagnetic. Uh, but 8 hertz passed straight through. Um, he continued 
uh, with double Faraday's and then triple Faraday's, uh, it went straight through. So that means eight cycles has to auto-rotate 180 degrees, 90 and 90, through non-locality, like Bell non-locality, virtuality, past, present and future, and then rotate back to linearity. So it acts like an interdimensional bridge, a little bit like the owls of Mike, in a sense. People in the Faraday cage, saturated with negative ions, uh, would also have an increased ability in Psi scores, that's remote viewing, numbers or drawings, in another room or even in another lab. Um, as they were shielded from linear electromagnetics and the negative ions together with the shielding enabled their Psi abilities, their eight cycles uh, amplification to occur. Um, this is one of the early double Faraday cage labs in uh, Glen Cove, May 1952. This was done over several decades of research. Eight hertz also passed straight through a superconductor. Super cool superconductor. Um, and Dr. Luc Montagnier did a teleportation of DNA at 7 hertz. He would have sterile water in one container, and he would have a bacterial DNA in the other, surrounding them both with a 7 hertz field in the sterile water. The bacterial DNA was teleported. He's now, his work has been used by the HeartMath Institute to start to teleport stem cells into the Petri dish DNA sample. Last word is they were successful. So anthropixations, that is clear willed intent with biological coherence, changing the DNA, mankind waking up as genetic engineers of themselves and teleporting stem cells, that means regeneration um, and the UFO comes directly into correlation at Hess-Darlin. So the Hess-Darlin um, phenomena, measured by scientists from many, many different countries since the 1980s, suddenly there is a plasma vehicle that appears. The plasma vehicle becomes solid. It will travel um, at a fast rate, 30,000 kilometers. A spectrum analysis is done as the object goes 30,000 kilometers an hour, turns 90 degrees, 30,000 kilometers an hour, which is pretty much impossible. The spectrum analysis shows the rare earth element, scandium, which in fact occurs in the mines, former Nazi mines, of Hestalen, Norway, underneath Trondheim. Um, so we decided to engage the protocol there. Um, we would utilized the, the, the webcam, and we went there hundreds of times, no protocol, absolutely nothing appeared. Two times, we utilized the protocol, and immediately, the phenomena is this well recorded and databased by the Hestal Research Association um, and the Hestal Project in Norway, um, the phenomena appears, two times, Eight hertz was the key in that manifestation. Dr. Erling Strand stating that between seven and eight hertz would regularly be picked up just before the manifestation of the Hestalen light phenomenon. So cos the art of cosmic contact involves more than just some superior intelligence. It's more like there is a cosmic intelligence um, but this is not a conclusion. It is more like, we say, uh, it's not a given, that there's clearly some form of cosmic intelligence that also wants to synergize with who and what we are, the best of humanity. And the best of humanity is art and culture. So as the creators of the, uh, the instigators of the uh, 432 hertz and 8 hertz music, popular music movement, the classical world has done that since uh, Verdi, uh, 100 years or so uh, further back, but in the popular electronic music, 432 hertz. 432 hertz has been shown in clinical studies to ameliorize psychiatric disorders when listened to as classical music for 18 months. The 432 hertz music system with 8 hertz utilized in 
all forms possible, the arpeggators oscillate at 8 hertz, low frequency oscillations in our synthesizers, 8 hertz, the panning of the drums, 8 hertz. We put it at every level possible. Concerts, cultural concerts, which are linked together with the same circadian tempos, 72 BPM or 144 BPM if you want to dance, uh, if you want to, want to go psytrance, 288 BPM, we just did it. We demonstrated it in the uh, Ozora uh, Music Festival. Um, and it works. Uh, these are harmonics of the heart at the moment of love. In the drum beat, 8 hertz and 432 hertz. One creates a cascade of cultural concerts linked together through the internet, bringing out the most and greatest coherence, biological coherence, um, and taking antennas by Dr. Andrew Weisbaum in Switzerland, which absorb the ambience of the audience, the body music. You put it into the software, Mathematica, put in a phi filter, so only the golden proportion in binomial sequence is taken, and then you mix that back into the channel. So you've got the audience being amplified and remembering their coherence, their biological coherence and dancing with that and starting to become cognizant of coherence. And then you mix in the best part of the audience's body, the coherence, so you're interacting with that. Then you link concert to concert to concert from country to country to country, and you've got a global song for engaging cultural, musical contact with the cosmos. We've had the scientists with SETI do it through radio astronomy. But what is the, the greatest goal of humanity? It's our creativity. It's our art. It's our culture. It's our music. So we suggest that this is a future for mankind. The um, whole layout of modern music, you have the Beatles coming in a dream of John Lennon. There is a UFO which turns into the pie in the sky, which turns into a beetle. And out comes a beam and a spaceman and says, you shall be called the Beatles. The testimonies about Elvis Presley and UFOs, so-called king of rock, it goes on and on. It's a big story. So it's as if popular modern music has already embedded in this cultural event that is to emerge where we use the best we can, the best of musicology, the best scientific pitch, 432 hertz was called. Scientific pitch, it was the best pitch that scientists could come up with. The C note based on 8 hertz going to 512 hertz, A is 432, and it engages 8 hertz. 8 hertz is the gate and is the art of the consciousness artist for cosmic contact, is our suggestion of the future of this research with ever more chartering of the physical parameters as part of the dance. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Fantastic. Fantastic work.